I give the call now to the honourable member for Hughes. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. I'm pleased this evening to rise to speak on the Corporations Amendment Professional Standards and Financial Advisors Bill. Deputy Speaker, this bill makes amendments to the Corporations Act to raise the education, training and ethical standards of financial advisors by requiring relevant providers to hold a degree or a higher or equivalent qualification, pass an exam, undertake a professional year, undertake continuous professional development and comply with the code. Deputy Speaker, the reason for this legislation is in recent years numerous cases of inappropriate financial advice have been shown to have a negative impact on consumers' confidence in the financial services industry. This lack of trust is said to become a barrier to consumers seeking legal advice. The financial services industry, consumer groups, the government and the Australian Securities Investment Commission have raised concerns with the existing education and training requirements for financial advisors. The bill includes the following amendments to the Corporations Act. Deputy Speaker. New education and training standards must be met by individuals who provide personal advice on relevant financial products to retail clients. Transitional arrangements will apply to existing advisors. New requirements that relevant providers will have to comply with a code of ethics. There will be an obligation for the Australian Financial Services licensee to ensure that its relevant providers comply with the new education standards and are covered by compliance schemes. There will be a restriction on the titles financial advisor and the term financial planner so that they can only be used by persons who are relevant providers. Amendments to the context content requirements for the register will be the relevant providers. The provision for appropriate sanctions where a relevant provider or licensee fails to comply with new obligations. And there will be recognition of a new standards body which will set up the details of the new education standards and develop the code. Specialist knowledge about the specific products an advisor provides on and the markets in which they operate and a generic knowledge requirement including training on the economic environment, the operation of financial markets and financial products. Having said that, Deputy Speaker, it's very important for the public <clears throat> that take financial advice to realise, Deputy Speaker, that financial advisers do not always get it right. In fact, Deputy Speaker, one of the books I read over the holiday break was a book titled Tyranny of the Experts that listed so many times throughout our history where the so-called experts have got it exactly wrong. And Deputy Speaker, just look at some examples from our recent history. Back in February 2008, Deputy Speaker, the price of oil hit 140 US dollars. Oil is a finite resource. The demand from China and India was growing and growing and growing. Surely, Deputy Speaker, the price of oil will continue to increase. That's what all the expert financial advisors said, Deputy Speaker. But from 140 US dollars, Deputy Speaker, in February 2008, it hit a low of $29 yep. in January 2016. How many experts predicted that? Last year, Deputy Speaker, we saw the price of coal stuck around the $50 mark. All the experts told us coal is on the way out, Deputy Speaker. There was an abundant supply of coal on the market. Therefore, nothing would happen. And the last six months of last year, Deputy Speaker, we saw the price of coal increase 100%. Yet again, hardly a single financial expert picked that. Then, Deputy Speaker, we have the currency fluctuations. I can tell you, Deputy Speaker, from over 25 years of watching how the Australian dollar has moved against the US dollar <clears throat> and what all the experts have predicted, the best advice that I could do, give to anyone, Deputy Speaker, is do exactly the opposite of what the experts tell you when it comes to currency forecasts. Then we had the recent Trump rally, Deputy Speaker. All the experts told us 
that if Donald Trump was elected successful at the US presidential election, it would be a disaster for the world economy, Deputy Speaker. That's what all the experts told us. And yet, Deputy Speaker, we have seen a Trump rally, an almost 10 per cent increase in US stock prices, almost $2 trillion extra created. Again, the complete opposite of what the experts told us. Brexit, Deputy Speaker, this was meant to be a disaster for the British economy. We were told by the experts that if the Britain decided to leave the EU, this would be disastrous for the economy. Yet, Deputy Speaker, an article from January the 6th this year, it says, and I quote, Britain ended last year as the strongest of the world's advanced economies, with growth accelerating in the six months after the Brexit vote. Business activity hit a seven-month high. Andrew Halladane, chief economist of the Bank of England, suggested economic forecasters, forecasters were facing what they called a Michael Fish moment over their mistaken predictions, referring to the BBC weather forecaster, and he compared the profession's failure to spot the 2008 recession to Mr Fisher's infamous assurance that there would be no hurricane on the eve of the great storms in England in 1987. He said, it's a fair cop to say that the profession, that's the financial advisors, Deputy Speaker, is in some degree of crisis. He also admitted the shortcomings in pre-Brexit predictions saying the data had surprised on the upside. An assessment by Cambridge University criticised what was described as flawed and partisan Treasury forecasts from Britain's economy outside the EU. Deputy Speaker, because then it's glad the member for Port Adelaide is at the table, because I know he has been one Deputy Speaker that has been listening to the experts that tell us if we get all this renewable energy, Deputy Speaker, electricity prices will go down. We've seen, Deputy Speaker, history has shown us what a complete and utter nonsense that is, Deputy Speaker, and nowhere other than the member for Port Adelaide's home state of South Australia. Now, Deputy Speaker, if financial advisers are looking at the expert advice, there is also a few other good examples from history Giving you some deputy speaker, some recent examples. I'd like to go back for a few historical examples how the experts have got it wrong. A prediction, deputy speaker, from the president of the Michigan Savings Bank. This quote: "The horse is here to stay, but the automobile is a novelty and a fad." Thank goodness people didn't follow the predictions of that expert. Another one, deputy speaker, H.M. Warner of Warner Brothers. In 1927, who would be more expert in his industry? He said, and I quote, who the hell wants to hear actors talk? Yeah. Another one, Deputy Speaker, from Dr. Dionardus Lada, a science writer and academic back in 1828. Deputy Speaker, he said, rail travel at high speed is not possible because passengers unable to breathe would die of asphyxia. Deputy Speaker, Lord Kelvin, is there anyone, Deputy Speaker, with greater qualifications than Lord Kelvin, President of the Royal Society, who said, Deputy Speaker, in 1883, X-rays will prove to be a hoax? Thomas Watson, the Chairman of IBM, Deputy Speaker, another expert in computer fields. Where else could you have someone with higher qualifications? In 1945, Deputy Speaker said, I think there is a world market for maybe five computers. Another expert, Deputy Speaker, the head of 20th Century Fox, and I quote Deputy Speaker, the expert from the entertainment industry said, television won't be able to hold on to any market it captures after the first six months. People will get very tired of staring at a plywood box every night. <laughs> and of course, Deputy Speaker, there's the exact opposite. There are those that haven't had the formal education the Deputy Speaker have had the streetwise sense to get their predictions right. And Deputy Speaker, in the time allowed, I'd like to go through a few examples. Of course, Deputy Speaker, Henry Ford, the founder of Ford Motor Companies, someone who had no real education and yet, Deputy Speaker, revolutionised the world 
with the Ford Motor Company. J.D. Rockefeller, the business magnate, left school at 16 years of age. Deputy Speaker, quit school. Larry Ellison, the founder of Oracle Deputy Speaker, a self-made billionaire, dropped out of two colleges, never completed his degree. Ralph Lauren, that famous fashion designer deputy speaker, he left college after two semesters and never attended a fashion school, and yet deputy speaker, he is, says, Ralph Lauren name is synonymous with high fashion. Steve Jobs, the co-founder of Apple, only graduated from high school and dropped out of college. And so did Steve Wozniak, the other co-founder of Apple. Richard Branson, deputy speaker, never completed high school and dropped out at the age of 16 years. Not only that, he was said to be dyslexic and had a poor academic performance. Deputy Speaker, I could go on and on and on and on. We need to be very careful that we do not think that there is this expert opinion that is always right, because our history, Deputy Speaker, tells us it is the opposite. Now, Deputy Speaker, I'd also like to make um, a few comments on this debate that was added by the member for Fenner when he talked about the need for a Royal Commission into banks. The member for Fenner said, and I think I've got the quote right, and he said, only a Royal Commission will allow victims to be heard. Deputy Speaker, that is absolute, complete and utter nonsense, and it shows that the member for Fenner does not understand the problem. The victims, Deputy Speaker, need either a tribunal or a one-stop shop or a commissioner that can hear their, not only hear their complaint, Deputy Speaker, and it's not just about hearing their complaint, it's about getting compensation for these people. And that's exactly what we've seen, Deputy Speaker. We've seen the Kate Carnell report recently released, and I congratulate the minister at the table for commissioning that report that has gone and looked at some of these things, something that a Royal Commission would take years and years and years to do and cost tens of billions of dollars, has already been done. And the Kate Carnell report, Deputy Speaker, has found that in several cases that there has been unconscionable conduct. So what the people that are victims of that unconscionable conduct, Deputy Speaker, what they don't need, the very last thing that they need is some long-winded Royal Commission that goes on for years and years and years and, Deputy Speaker, by the time that Royal Commission even finished, they would be time barred for their cases under our Trade Practices Act, or now called the Competition Act, Deputy Speaker. We need the procedures so those people can be heard and they can get their compensation done. And if there is unconscionable conduct by the banks, Deputy Speaker, we have the laws, we have the regulation, let the tribunal or the, or the courts, let it be heard. And that's, Deputy Speaker, what this coalition is doing. We are not about grandstanding about a Royal Commission. We want to get compensation for those people that have been victims of unconscionable conduct for the bank, as were the, those on the other side, Deputy Speaker. They're only interested in a complete grandstanding of a Royal Commission. It's a different thing, Deputy Speaker. It shows the difference. We on this side of the chamber about getting the job done and about getting results, and those on the other side, Deputy Speaker, they are just about grandstanding and being show ponies. Now, Deputy Speaker, the other thing that I'd, while I'm on the issue of financial advice and advisers, Deputy Speaker, one thing any financial advisor would look at in the years to come, Deputy Speaker, is the corporate, the competitiveness of an Australian business. Deputy Speaker, we currently have a corporate tax rate of 30 per cent. That may have well, Deputy Speaker, been suitable back in the early part of this century when Peter Costello, the former Treasurer of this nation, lowered our company tax rate from 36 per cent back to 30 per cent. That may have been right for that time, Deputy Speaker. But we now live in a world, Deputy Speaker, we have the UK at 20 per cent corporate tax rate. We have Hong Kong and Singapore at 15 and 17. And we have the USA, Deputy Speaker, about to go to 15. We can no longer, Deputy Speaker, expect to get the investment that we need in this country if we're going to have an uncompetitive corporate tax rate that is double the USA. So, Deputy Speaker, I ask those on the other side of the chamber, forget your grandstanding, forget your politicking, do what is right for this country, for this country's economy, for those businesses out there. If you want to get jobs created, if you want to get economic growth going, 
join with us with our enterprise tax plan. Let's get these tax cuts, these legislation reduction in corporate tax rate through the House and through the Senate as soon as we possibly can. And then, Deputy Speaker, the we may need to go I again. I thank the honourable member for his very valued contribution.